Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pods of the Multiverse. We're an unofficial D&D podcast where four friends play D&D. We are so glad to have you back at the table for our third game. My name's Andy, and I'm the DM for our adventures in the world of Theros. Let's reintroduce the players for this game. I'm Jimmy. I play Gron, the friendly Minotaur. I'm Scala. I will be playing Andromedy brand snake food. Andromedy brand, same great human flavor, no added gender. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> oh my god. It took me one week to write that joke. My name is Jeppy. I play Clix, who is a Leonin and definitely not a Minotaur shaped like Gron in disguise. So anyways, our Discord's really happen. It, it is. I, I'm... I'm happy with the Discord. I'm pretty thrilled. We have so many great people in it. Thank you for engaging with us. Please continue to do so. Your parasocial relationship means a lot to us. If you're listening and you're not in the Discord, you just know this. It's a fun place. You can talk about a bunch of fun stuff. There are some good memes. So come in, flex your meme emoji muscles, and, uh, and, and flex them hard and hang out with us, please. Thank you. Thank you. Again, that's Pods of the Multiverse official Discord. We'll let you in. You've got some usable content now, yes, Jimmy? We can stop this farce? Usable content? Oh my goodness. I'm rolling in usable content. The metrics are off the chart. Okay, we can put a bullet in this dying cat. <laughs> <laughs> Without further ado, let's jump back into the game. A brief recap of our second game. After the party was assembled within the walls of Akros, they quickly moved along the Rowan Way in search of the Citadel to find more answers about their connected fates. They quickly passed through the massive Colosseum, or the Temple of Triumph, where they saw several crowds of people gathering to escape the ensuing siege. From there, they made their way up steep steps towards the Citadel and found themselves at the outer walls of the Colophon, the prestigious nobility district of Akros, where they were quickly stopped and barred from entry. After talking with the guards there, they saw two figures flying overhead, one of them being Polymede, who, through a message spell, communicated to Andromedy that the time for them to reunite had not yet come to pass. After hearing these words, they received an omen calling them towards the mountains, and the flame speakers of which they formerly trained under. You went into the mountains, you climbed towards the Flame Speakers Monastery, and after about two days of travel and various encounters along the way, you find yourselves at the monastery atop the mountains, having just met the Flame Speaker Volkos, the former mentor of Andromedy who, after saying that he had himself seen a vision of Akros under siege, greeted you all. So, the three of you stand before this open monastery. You see the various pools of water and lava and statues and fountains, all of the robed figures and other alk lights within the space. Shut up, I can see you fucking <laughs> smiling that I... It's, it's acolytes. 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 God damn it. Various acolytes. <laughs> I'm just not gonna say that word anymore. <laughs> Disciples is a synonym. Sages. Flame speakers. Uh, devotees. Devotees. It's devotees. Oh, God. Devotees. Now, what do the three of you do? This must be the place. Yes. Volkos, it's good to see you. I go over I go over to give him a hug. Great. You approach. He's maybe about 5'2, really stout, big, like round, built frame, huge arms, bald head with like red and bronze tattoos on his head, and a long, unkept beard. Looking about like mid 50s ish. He gets up from his meditation and quickly returns the hug, his large forearms gripping you tightly, and he says, I have seen it in the fire and the smoke. 
Akros is under siege indeed. Tell me, tell me of your journey. Yes, I, I wish it was under better circumstances that I returned here. But indeed, I was caught in the battle and I was able to escape it with the help of these two brave persons behind me. Oh, are they two followers of Clothis? No. Well, as you can see, one is a Leon and I, I suspect they follow no god. I don't know anything about a clothing maker. Wait, what? Was that supposed to be a joke, friend? Yeah. <laughs> God yeah. damn it, Jeffy! <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, I suspect the Leonin follows no god, and I am unsure of the Minotaur, though he does not seem to have the fury of Mogus in him. He kind of gently pushes you aside and strides towards Clix and Gron. He quickly looks over both of you very closely, very intently. He stops at Gron and says, ah, Do you follow Mogus? Not if I can help it. <sighs> I see. He quickly moves past you and towards Clix, looking you up and down. And what of you, Leonin? Are you an iconoclast like the rest of your people? That's wise of you to assume. I would say you're mostly right about that. It's not to say I don't answer to a higher calling of some sort, though. I see. Well, please don't allow me to further assume anything. He kind of shrugs his shoulders and moves back towards the fountain, where he continues, Ah, the followers of Mogus carry a foul stench of death with them as of late, and Eroes himself can scarcely hold his ground, the twin war gods ever battling. And as he speaks, you can see he is gesturing with his hands in such a way that the various fumes from the lava pools and steam from the water pools kind of flow and float around his hands, and he continues, other fights have winners and losers, casualties of war on both sides of the ages. They are and have always held a balance between the savagery and the brutality of war. And in one hand you can see, out of these clouds, various weapons, uh, spears and axes and arrowheads dancing in his hands. And he goes on, in the honor and heroic victory of battles well fought and won. And on the other hand, you can see small figures, humanoid figures, marching and various flags and filigree waving about in his hand. For if one force were to overtake the other wholly, their duality could fade from Nyx. And then who knows what could happen? He slams his two hands together and the smoke erupts into a small burst of lava, which quickly falls to the ground. Come, we have much to discuss about your fates. And he ushers the three of you to sit with him in this scene. And then he turns to Andromeda and says, Now then, what would you make of this? I know there is a great rage possessing Clothis when I hear her voice. The damage to destiny is great, and this imbalance, I have no doubt, is related to that damage. Perhaps ripples from the upset that the false god of revels created, or some other unknown force. I cannot be sure, but this seems related to the great fury of Clothus. I see. Indeed, the balance of Nyx itself, this very ideal, so powerful, what many believe emboldened Heliod to send his champion into Nyx to slay Xenagos. As you say, for what chaos must ensue if the whole of the Pantheon came crashing upon this mortal earth were one god to disrupt the order of their heavens? A fury against that indeed. Clix and Gron, as they're having this conversation, what are the two of you doing? Clix is definitely casing the joint. Okay. Looking over Olkos to see what kind of items there may or may not be on their person. Okay. Go ahead and give me a perception check. 18. Okay. You notice a lot of details about the kind of shrine that you're in the middle of right now, the pools and the statues. It all looks very fine and very well crafted. And whoever these heroes or these great followers of these gods of the mountains are, they certainly look very prestigious with their large and ornate statues. You see several small forges kind of strewn about the area, and at maybe about three or four of them, 
There are various disciples working, crafting different things. They're not all making weapons, though. Most of them actually just look to be making, like, pottery or jewelry, different little artistic trinkets out of molten bronze and other materials. They certainly look like they could be pretty valuable. Other than that, you see very sparse, simple buildings. None of them you think could fit many more than two or three people at a time. Very simple dwelling places, if anything. Now go ahead and give me an investigation check for Volkos himself, since he's a lot closer to you. This is a 14. Okay. He really has very few things on his person. He has a very heavy robe and almost <laughs> unironically what we would consider a lot of heavy like necklaces and, and jewelry hung around his neck and tied around his waist. You're not sure of the value, but a lot of it looks very nice. You don't see any weapons of any kind. Cool. Clix is just going to take note. Not do anything about that for now. Okay. Ron, what are you doing? What would look out of the ordinary in this area? I'm going to say, go ahead and give me a nature check. That's a one plus two. <laughs> Three. <laughs> awesome. So, Gron, you're looking around, and indeed, there is this large well of some kind. From one side is springing forth water, and from the other side, the same structure is pouring out this lava, this molten rock, down into these pools. On a one, Gron has no idea how any of this is possible. Whether or not he would think that this is just an ordinary occurrence this high up in the mountains, or whether it is, you know, a an act of miracle. Yeah, Gron's just taking this in. Okay. His eyes widen. He's uh, never seen anything like this before. Okay. Volkos goes on now kind of addressing more of the party in general. He stretches out his hands, and he says, I have watched these fighters my whole life, and like the ever-changing flame, or the ever-crashing tides, or the grass below, or the clouds above, as much as someone tries to hold on to anything in this world, nothing lasts. Clicks, go ahead and give me a wisdom save. 18. That last phrase quickly grabs your attention before you were paying no mind at all. Absolutely does, yeah. And when he says nothing lasts, you immediately get this, almost like a shiver down your spine. He goes on, even now the mountains change. More dangerous now than I have ever known in my lifetime. Monsters drawing forth from cavern depths. Beasts becoming larger and wilder than any one of us has ever seen. <sighs> he sighs heavily. Even the dragons. The dragons that call the highest mountaintops that are domain. Dragons? He looks at you, Gran. Aye. Have you ever seen such a thing, friend Minotaur? No. Gran, go ahead and give me either a history or nature check again. 21, nature. Holy shit. Even as a very small child, Gron would remember the people around him talking about dragons as if they were almost like boogeymen of mountains. Like, deeply, deeply feared and revered that to talk about them, to discuss them, almost puts them as much in the mythical status as they would be to our real world. So much so that, like in our real world, we kind of have this fantastical understanding of a lot of things that we think dragons do or are. And I think, Gran, you would know even a handful of stories about dragons in the mountains and how cruel they can be, how vicious, how greedy, and also just how incredibly powerful some of them can be. Luckily, i never come across one. I hope I never do. That is a good thing to hope for, indeed. Any spawn of Thraxes is a fearsome foe. Nonetheless, the more ancient that reside in the highest peaks of the mountains. Andromedy, go ahead and give me a history check when he mentions Thraxes. Uh, that'll be a 17. Okay. You've probably heard Volkos or any of the other flame speakers 
bring up Thraxes many times while you were here. Thraxes is probably one of, if not the, most famous dragon in Theros. After Gran speaks, Volkos looks toward you, Andromedy, and says, <laughs> You remember the last time I told the story? Yes, Thraxes is a very old dragon. When Perforos abandoned his first forge in Mount Velus, Thraxes took up residence there, and there he resides, presiding over all of Perforos's discarded treasures as his hoard. Indeed. <laughs> Perforos revered with such an honor as to grant him dominion over that great high peak itself. It is said that the fires from Perforos's forges have only made that dragon stronger, a deadly beauty of the magic of the natural world and Nyx itself. <laughs> he gets up mid-conversation. Well, Gloth has sent you here to me. To me, like the molten earth, our threads entwine once more. <sighs> A meek, overly observant Leonin. Good. Quiet, but foreboding Minzar. And the Oracle, ever searching for meaning in the threads that lie before them. There are many more answers to many more questions we have yet to ask. But come, I am getting hungry. And he points towards one of the small buildings where an evening meal is being prepared. I'm sure your travels have left you weary. Come. Gladly. I go with him. Yeah. Okay. Flix gives a nod of approval. Follow suit. I before we go, I just like put a put a hand on his arm and be like, "Indeed, there is more we must speak of. This imbalance has Perforos given you any guidance?" I have looked into these flames, and I feel a cold that I've never felt before. Mathitis. An ill omen indeed, Sophistis. But this can wait. Yeah, let's eat. On our way over there, I want to just take Andromedy aside and quietly say, Should we uh, tell him about the thing? The thing I broke? Am I going to be in trouble for that? Or, are you going to be in trouble for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it might be a show of good faith for you to apologize. But again, the servants of Perforos... Uh, express themselves through creation and destruction, so I doubt they will hold it against you that you destroyed one of their guardians. That's pretty cool. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't, I don't have anything to say. Uh, Ron shrugs. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> All right, so you make your way over to this evening meal that you see being laid out before you. You see all manner of flame-roasted and grilled meats and uh, fresh vegetables, certainly not a wide selection of things that I'm sure Andromedy may have grown used to in Akros, or even clicks uh, foraging in the city streets, um, but it is a well-cooked spread, and you see Volkos kind of at the head of this gathering. Uh, where there are a myriad of other people uh, on either side of him, similarly dressed, but no one in kind of the same regalia as Volkos has. He stands before all of them and says, Flame speakers of the mountains, welcome these weary travelers as they search for answers, both for themselves and for everyone in the world below. You hear a myriad of voices kind of all at once, Say, God of the forge and mountains above, honor these guests. Volkos goes on. Now we eat, and later we look into the great flame. And they begin passing these meals about. Is any of this beef? Uh, go ahead and give me. <laughs> probably not this high in the mountain. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. I'd, I'd expect, like, goat, probably, but... Interesting dilemma. I see where you're going. Go ahead and give me a perception check. At least you're not a satyr, right? <laughs> it's 15. You don't think so. It is mostly... It almost looks like lamb, maybe some venison or some elk, but nothing nearly as red as beef. Gron would eat beef, by the way. I, I agree. I mean, I, minotaurs yeah. are yeah. cannibalistic. Sure. So... He wouldn't balk at eating yeah, not at all. a lesser cow. A lesser cow. Yes. Eat that lesser cow. Okay. 
Yeah. Clix is going to not wait much longer and just help himself. And he's not going to sit down. I don't know if they're seating at this area, but he's going to you know, stand over the displays and start picking at the food that he prefers. And sure. just eating it. Yeah, that's what he'll be doing for now. There are various stone benches and other large rocks made into makeshift chairs and different things. But most of the flame speakers you see just sit on the ground. Very, very bare, sparse, any sort of furnishings or anything really that you can see in the immediate area. All of the houses, all of the all of the structures, even all of the furniture, it's all either rough cut or very finely made stone or marble structures. Andromedy, you can see Volkos at the end of this large gathering table. He's eating and kind of eyeing the scene between you and your companions. I think like I'll take this sort of group environment to maybe like greet some of the like people I might have studied with while I was here previously. Sure. Go ahead and give me a quick perception check, please. Sure. An 11. Okay. Like I said before, there aren't like a ton of people here. There's maybe like all told a dozen, if that, like nine or 10 different people. On an 11, you recognize most of the people who are here. Although most of the time you only really studied under a handful of them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the difference between like an acquaintance or a neighbor yeah. and your actual teachers. Just off the dome, what do you think Andromedy would have studied kind of more specifically than just trying to hone their oracular skills with Volkos? I expect I was gaining wizard levels while I was here, so likely sort of the study, like the, the practical study of magic, uh, you know, the, the flow of mana and how to shape it and things of that nature. Cool. Just write down some random names here. No, all those suck. All those suck. Yeah, no, this guy's name is not Thanos. <laughs> okay, here we go. These are easy enough. And the two that you recognize are Marcos and Yanis. Marcos is a evocation wizard, and Yanis is a forge domain cleric. And the two of them really did the brunt of your spellcraft and, and actual magical studies whereas Volkos handled much more of the kind of religious and the philosophical side of and, things. and all, all yeah. of that sort of thing. Yeah. They're there at the table. They greet you warmly. Yanis, the cleric, nods towards you. We are all very surprised to see you back so soon, Andromedy. Tell us, what was Akros like before the siege? It was strange. There's a very particular air that people carry around there. They are very competitive. They wish to stand out and above from other people. It's not quite like it is here. I, I understand, you know, everyone is always trying to improve their craft, but for the sake of themselves. And in Akros, it's very much people do not develop themselves for personal development, but for, for status and, and glory. It took some getting used to, I, I think. They don't like minotaurs too much there. Yanis looks towards you, Gron, as you say this, uh, and you can see almost a tinge of orange in his eyes. Ah, I would not pay that notion any mind, friend. Akros can be a very difficult place for people who are not from there. Or people who have horns. In so few words, yes. Yanis looks back towards you, and... It's at this point, I think, uh, Andromedy, you notice that, like, the entire time you've been talking to him, he's kind of been working something in one of his hands, and it's at that point you can see, just, like, casually, he is making a small brass ring with one hand, kind of just working this small molten heap of metal into a ring, and as he begins to kind of finish its shape, he places it on the table in front of you, still cooling uh, on the stone, and he says, I just hope that their methods haven't dulled your sense of wonder about things that I always enjoyed. I will say, the oracle of Keranos there is a constant source of wonder. She is very erratic, 
uh, and difficult to follow at times. But... Volkos from across the other side of the room. Sounds like she'd fit right in up here. What's the problem? There's a political difficulty. The space left where Siamede once was. As you say, Siamede, the entire gaggle of flame speakers kind of falls to a hush. Sorry, I, I did not mean to open old wounds. Clix looks up for a moment and then keeps eating. Marcos, the wizard teacher, looks up and speaks very gruffly. Marcos being quite a bit older, even than Volkos. Pay them no mind, Andromedy. The mystery of the missing queen is something we have yet to fully understand in the flames, is all. And goes back to eating. I am certain whatever purpose Keranos has for her, it is of great significance. And I, I go back to eating, because I'm not, I'm not actually sure of that, but I want to be reassuring. Yeah, I have something to tell you guys. <laughs> Just give me, like, a flat charisma check. Okay. <laughs> That's a one. Plus two. You just say that off the cuff in the middle of this meal, and every single one of them just kind of looks up very slowly towards you. I, uh, I smashed one of your hounds. A couple of them kind of give an, an odd side eye, and the rest of them all look at Volkos very confused. Volkos says, Hounds? Yeah, like, uh, the metal beast. Go ahead and roll Persuasion. Okay. 22. You say that, and all of them begin laughing. <laughs> Volkos, amid this laughing, says, You hear that, boys? He thinks those anvil rots are ours. Like we would wish to aspire to such creation. Uh, if, they're, if they're not yours... Whose are they? Oh, well. He kind of stands up over the scene and points towards one of the only mountains that still stretches much taller than the one that you are atop right now. He points towards Mount Velas and he says, The Envelrots belong to him. The dragon? <laughs> they all continue laughing. <laughs> <laughs> the god of the forge himself, Parphoros. Created on whims, he casts them about the mountains like playthings. Some of them take to being guardians of shrines, and others wander the wilds, just like the rest of their more natural counterparts. You cast no grave will against Perforos, for I'm sure he has destroyed multitude in the blink of an eye faster than you brought down one little wolf. Oh no, it was pretty fast. <laughs> I bet you were. He goes back to eating. So does that mean I could uh, go out and break some more? It's kind of fun. Perhaps with a bit of caution. If they were trying to harm you in any way, then surely defeating one in combat would not pay Perforos any ill omen. But perhaps lend to a good omen in your favor. All right. Well, I mean, you're, you're friends with the guy. You could just ask him, right? <laughs> I like you, Gran. You're the one I like. I have only beheld Perforos once. And even then, he does not hold any of his followers as friends, as you put it. He kind of looks up towards you. Perforos is not like many of the other gods, even Mogus. He holds dominion over everything that springs from mortal ingenuity. Most artisans say a small prayer to him upon beginning or completing nearly anything, from swords to ships to temples. Naturally, he is associated with the forge. Nearly every smith on Theros is a sort of temple to him, regardless of their professions. His acts are not because of grand plans or high ideals, but on the whims of his restless and creative mind. On rare occasions when he contemplates what he would do if he were to rise in opposition to any of the other gods, 
his most fervent wish would be to be left alone to his creations. And thus, you see, is the way of most of his followers, including us. This Perforo seems like a pretty good fella. <laughs> <laughs> While the uh, commotion was going on about the uh, wolf, uh -huh. clicks definitely tried to sneak some food into his uh, robe. Go ahead and roll sleight of hand. It's a 16. Okay. Ooh, interesting. You go ahead and do that, and you don't really get any reaction, any blatant stares or anything from anyone. This scene continues on for a little while, into the evening, into the night, and you slowly begin to see the displays of Nyx overhead. But unlike when you saw it outside of Akros while you were traveling along the mountain paths, the various fumes and smoke from the forges and pools of this monastery, as they rise up high into the sky above, dispersed by the winds of the high mountain tops. It's almost as if the displays of Nyx are amplified, and various star clouds and constellations dance about with much more brilliance than you've ever seen. Save for perhaps Andromeda, you would recognize this phenomenon. As the evening meal begins to wind down, the various flame speakers return to their business, many of them beginning evening rituals of prayer before their forges or before the various fires about the areas. Volkos again pulls the three of you back towards the central shrine, where atop the fountain, a large red fire now burns. Now then, I remember keenly your constant rebuttals of my teaching practices. But they were not without reason. Look into that flame, Mavitis. Look beyond what you see, and tell me what you feel. And on the last bit of those words, you hear the crackling of the fire in front of you. What do you do? I put myself in sort of a meditative mindset, and I look into the flame in search of messages from the gods. As Andromeda does this, Gron and Clix, what do you do? I'm also looking at the flame. I don't think I see anything, but the red flame is reflecting in my eyes. Mm, for sure. Clix also looks into the flame and not only sees nothing, but at least for the time he has looked into it so far, also feels absolute nothingness. Very edgy. So edgy. Don't get a paper cut on how edgy that is. God damn it. Andromeda. You are going to go ahead and make me a religion check with advantage. Wonderful. Uh, 23. All right. If you could for me just go into a little more specificity about how Andromeda looks into the flame, anything physically that they do or anything else. Yeah, so I think similarly to when they divine or sort of establish a bit of a connection to Nyx, the white ring around their pupil sort of grows to encompass their entire eye. You see their hands open up and they are sort of plucking and nodding and unknotting these invisible strands in front of them. Their breathing becomes very slow and deep. You enter your meditative state and for the first minute or so you don't feel any different you're on top of a mountain you're surrounded by the flame speakers and your new companions you feel the heat from the fire from the lava the thick humidity from the steam and water around you you're not sure how long this will go on. You're not sure how long it's been. Then suddenly, you feel cold. Oddly so. Empty and cold. And then from beneath your eyelids, your eyes twinge at a brilliant flash of multicolored light. And then you feel a thousand threads, like fine but heavy cord, wrap and pull you in every direction at once. Just as suddenly you feel the light fade from your face, and you feel the threads 
severed all at once. Your body is left heavy and weak under their broken weight, and cold darkness takes you. Give me a wisdom saving throw, please, with advantage. 16. Wind begins swirling all around you, and you feel the presence of something foul, yet faintly familiar. Clix and Gron, you see Andromedy meditating, perfectly still, as they described, for onwards of ten minutes. No change whatsoever. Andromedy, you suddenly speak, but your voice is not your own. Strong and speaking as if the weight of the entire world's fate hangs on her breath. Out of nowhere, Clix, Gron, Volkos, and everyone else in this monastery sees Andromedy's eyes burst open with swirling green and red light, and they speak not with their voice, but with someone else's. Know this feeling, and fear it. The balance of Nyx hangs by tattered threads. My chosen eyes, together with this raging protector and this cunning dagger, bound together through pasts to futures. Go forth and seek thy creation's eye. Andromeda, you collapse suddenly. Can I try to catch them? Sure. Go ahead and give me a deck save. That's a 21. You catch them. I see them start to wobble unsteady on their feet and reach out to catch them before they hit the ground. As Gron does that and steadies Andromedy in his hands, Clix just gives Gron a look, kind of conveying, like, do you still think this is all a good idea? Like, you know, like kind of thinking some weird shit is happening. Do you really think this person's worth following? Just kind of a glance that just says, like, I'm, I've got some doubts about what's going on here. I don't know if Gron would have the passive insight to catch all that, mm -hmm. but Gron is more sure than ever that this is something that's worth pursuing. The two of you do this immediately upon hearing these words and seeing Andromedy begin to faint. Volkos immediately extends his hand towards the flames as if he were trying to pull something out of it. And he says to the two of you, while Andromeda is momentarily unconscious, Both of you, do not look away. Tell me what you see. Tell me what you feel. Now! Do you look towards the fire? Gron first looks at Andromeda and sees that they're still unconscious, and then looks back at Volkos, and then looks into the fire. Clix is immediately startled when Volkos speaks, and you know, kind of shifts his head around a little bit, but then settles into looking back at the fire. Okay. As you look up and into it, immediately you see something within the flame. I need both of you to make wisdom saving throws. 16 for me. 16 for me. Okay. We'll start with clicks. Kind of shocked at this scene a bit. Unknowing of what's going on and whether or not you believe any of this. You look into the fire and suddenly you see a beautiful jade stone. This sort of brilliant yet dull rock set into a necklace. That necklace is hanging around the neck of your father, Lyukar, as he appears to be issuing commands to the Crowan soldiers, hoplites perhaps. You flash again and you see the battle in which he gained his militaristic prowess, gained his reputation, gained his status in Akros. He is wearing that same necklace. Finally, you see him in a shadowy corner of a beautiful villa in the Colophon as he watches your mother die before your eyes. Previously, Clix did not know that he was there. How... What's the word I'm looking for? I got him. I got him. I stumped him. Uh, I think it's lucid, but I'm not 100%. But how with it am I mentally right now? Like, how, how transfixed am I on this scene? Yeah, I think I think lucid is a good word lucid for it. Lucid is definitely the correct word there. Go ahead and give me a intelligence saving throw. Six. 
you absolutely cannot tell up from down. You are seeing these flashes of scenes, visions coming one after another. And on that roll, I think you're just trying to process everything that you're looking at, let alone try and discern anything about them. In that kind of transfixed state, Glix is going to try and reach to the flame to try and grab at that necklace and take it. Okay. Hell yeah. Go ahead and give me another intelligence save. Nine. Okay. You reach out your hand towards this necklace that you see almost as if it were in the same, like, orientation in every scene. Mm -hmm. You reach out, and when you go to grab it, when you think your hand is going to reach around the stone, you grab at nothing and are pulled out of the vision back to the flame speakers. Gron, you look into the flame, and just as quickly, you are pulled into a scene, a very familiar scene, one that you lived through just days ago. You are back at the outer gates of Akros, looking at Hargot Bloodhorn. But this time, when you look at him, a very particular detail about him is much more striking, and that is of the enormous ruby necklace around his neck, with a single large gem that, as you look at it in this vision, is glowing a deep blood red. You flash, and you see that same necklace around his neck when he cast you out of your warband all those years ago. What do you do? Without taking my eyes off Hargot, I reach looking for my mall in the area around me. I like that. That's great. Very cool. Go ahead and give me an intelligence saving throw. 11. Okay. You go to grab your mall. You, f you find it on your back. I should note, not only do you see your younger self, you see a younger Califex, too. Seeing this scene before me that has played out so many times in my mind since it happened so many years ago, I immediately, involuntarily feel rage come over me and grip my maul and charge towards Hargot. You try and charge towards Hargot in this vision. Make me a strength saving throw. 22. Hell yeah. You feel as though you are getting closer to this scene. You have your man-sized maul ready to swing down on the man that left you for dead. Roll an attack. 12 to hit. You swing down, and immediately you are pulled from this vision. You see that you have swung into the fountain at the monastery and broken the side that the lava pours out of. And so now, rather than streaming gently out of the side of the fountain, this lava is beginning to very chaotically pool off the side of this fountain. Andromedy is on the ground behind you. You are raging. So I actually entered a rage in real life. Yes, but in this moment, in this space, in this real space, you can smell Hargot, and you can smell the fear that you had as a child. But not only that, you sense that somewhere out there, Califex is looking for you just as much as you are him. Andromedy, you awaken to this scene. If I actually entered a rage, everyone within 10 feet of me took two points of fire damage. Clicks, Andromedy, and Vokos all take two fire damage. Andromedy, maybe that's actually what wakes you up from your slight unconscious state, kind of singeing of the air and, and the sand swirling around Gron, as if you can hear Vokos shouting, Tell me! Tell me what you saw! So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Uh, there is currently volcanic magma spewing out around us. Clix is going to run. That, that's not a conversation Clix is going to entertain at the moment. Clix is running. Clix gets the fuck out. I also step away from the sort of free-flowing lava. Sure. Gron, you are you are right next to said lava. What are you doing? I punch the lava. I'm still in a rage. Correct. I should also say Volkos is standing pretty much right next to you because he was kind of trying to manipulate this fire somehow, or seemingly so, and he doesn't appear to be moving at all. My eyes dart around, and I see Volkos, and I say, 
Where is he? Who? Where is who? Argot. And I grip my maul even tighter. As you do, your eyes are bright red. Who is Hargot? Tell me. Tell me so I can look. Be cool to say something cool here. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> also because <laughs> about after like approximately one line of dialogue, your rage is going to end unless you do something about it. I'm going to attack the fountain again. Okay. Make an attack roll. It's a nine to hit. Okay. Do you say anything? You just attack. I just attack. I still feel that Hargot is here in my presence. I don't understand what's going on. I'm just in a rage and attacking anything near me. You swing down and you hit, but it kind of grazes off the momentum of your swing, not quite lining up. And you swing down and your maul hits the lava that's now collecting on the ground rather than in a pool. You take six points of fire damage as this lava kind of splashes back up onto your legs and your lower body. And Volkos says, No, don't let go. Don't let go of that rage. Who is he? Who is he? Where is he? Our God. <laughs> he looks into the fire as you keep saying this. And for just the briefest flash, you see that Hargot is still at the gates of Akros. It appears as though the Minotaur Horde is going to break the gates of Akros. And you see him shouting various things in Minotaur as if he is going to be one of the first ones through those gates. Your rage ends, and all of the sensations that you had trailing from that vision disappear. All of the pain that I had been powering through courses through me, and I feel the burns on my body and realize the horrible thing that I've done and back away from the fountain. As you back away, your eyes are still faintly glowing red, and in your mind you hear the voice of Mogus once more, as he says, Do you wish to take revenge? Do you wish to see him dead? Yes. As soon as you say yes, your maul, the flaming bits of lava at the end of it, ignite. And you gain three piety with Mogus and the ability to cast Searing Smite. Volkos reaches up and puts his hand on your shoulder. I jump a little bit. It's okay. You did well. Don't worry about the fountain. <laughs> <laughs> really, they break things all the time around here. It's like part of their religion. It really is. It's all right. Step back, please. Go. Oh, Go. Oh. Tell me. Tell me, all of you. What happened? I saw... A minotaur from my past. Hargot. Yes, you are shouting. The minotaur who left me for dead in the wasteland. I saw him. Clix is, uh, I mean, if there's a nearby bush, that's where Clix is. He's not well hidden, <laughs> though. Like, he just ran. Just go ahead and roll stealth anyways. Right. With disadvantage, because it was chaotic. 15. Okay. Maybe you're a little more well hidden than you thought. Maybe you made it all the way back to, like, the gathering area where you had eaten before. Clicks from a 40 foot or so distance, starts to resurface from a shrub that he decided was good covering, and starts to slowly walk back, but does not answer Volkos' question. Andromedy looks pointedly at Clicks. As you're looking at Clicks Andromedy, you can see Volkos stretching down his arm to help you up off the ground. I don't take it for the time being. Okay. In fact, Andromedy sort of holds their knees to their chest, a bit shocked, still feeling this sort of emptiness and and weight from their vision. Andromedy, go ahead and give me a, a con save, actually, as you sit in the fetal position. Sure. 21. Okay. You feel suddenly exhausted, but not enough so that you're actually mechanically exhausted. Right. This kind of overwhelming tiredness all of a sudden. The damage, the damage to destiny is greater, greater than I feared. Everything, everything is in peril. All could be lost. Deep breath, deep breath. I saw nothing but darkness, darkness. All of Clothis's designs undone. She fears this as well. This is why she has risen. Feel? What did you feel? Fear. Hollowness. A great weight. A great responsibility. He raises both of his hands and 
almost as if slashing at the air very quickly towards the fire. It goes out in an instant as he says, That will be enough of that for now. It is okay, Andromedy. We will figure this out. I take his hand and let him hoist me up from the ground, and then I, I look back again to Clix, sort of like, You've been awful quiet. Do you have a problem? You've been awful quiet. Well, pardon me, Preacher. I didn't think that running from lava warranted a conversation. I gesture back to where the flame was once burning. What did you see? Why do you need to know what I saw? That is why we have made this journey. What, to look in some fire and see something that isn't real? Is that what we made this journey for? How do you know it was not real? How do you know? Because I felt nothing. And is that itself not a feeling? I felt nothing, and then I felt anger, and then nothing again. A complete nothing. A total lack of purpose. If there's no reason for being here, then there's no reason for feeling. Fucking edgy edge shit right there. Get some band-aids, it's about to be cutting. Insight? Yeah, go ahead and roll an insight. That's gonna be a 23 insight. Yeah, absolutely no, he's full of shit. I mean, you can you can roll deception, I guess, to contest. He can try. I do not contest. <laughs> not with that roll. <laughs> yeah, Andromedy, I think you've kind of had a couple of hunches yeah. about clicks since you met him, but... It could not be any more apparent right now that he is absolutely full of shit. Andromedy again, like, smiles super broadly <laughs> at Clix and says, There is more at stake than whatever it is you are afraid of. <laughs> we must know. Please. No one here will judge you, but you have just as sure a part to play in this than I do, than Gran does. We must know. So you think I'm scared, that's it? I'm not scared. Are you lying? I'm absolutely I, lying. I gesture I gesture from the to the to the bush that he just crawled out of. Make another deception check with disadvantage. <laughs> okay. Oh, that was a nat twenty. Let's see what it goes down to. Oh, actually, okay. It's a twenty-five total. I got rolled a twenty and a nineteen. Fuck. You're putting on a brave face. Well, I gotta think about how I wanna say it. Give me like a, a second here. Getting into that good shit tonight. <laughs> so after um, Clix puts on a brave face for Andromedy and they continue to look at him skeptically, a moment of uncomfortable silence hangs in the air um, and Clix finally acquiesces and says, You want to know what I saw? I saw the last thing that I ever wanted to see again. I saw my father. He's a horrible, miserable bastard of a Leonin. And, and I need him dead. I need to kill him. Because that'll be the only thing I'll have ever done that's worth anything. Clicks, go ahead and give me a wisdom saving throw as you say that. Sure. That is uh, 13. Just for the briefest moment, you don't hear anything, but you feel the now vaguely familiar presence of Phoenix on your shoulder. Hmm. Just for a moment. And then it leaves. As if, as if like putting an arm around your shoulder. Got it. Hey, buddy! Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That wasn't so bad, was it? Clix does not like that. <laughs> One <laughs> bit. <laughs> and uh, kind of scoffs and scowls and puts the robe, you know, kind of, uh, kind of, the robe's been over his head this whole time, but, you know, kind of tilts his head in a way where the robe is going to obscure his face from Andromedy being able to, to continue to see it. Did you say these visions could be real? Well, from what you have told me, you saw a glimpse into your own pasts. But I also saw the gates of Akros. They won't hold. I see. I must meditate on this through the night, I think. I suggest the three of you get some rest. It is quite late, and I must take this evening to prepare. He turns around so his back is now facing you, and he is now facing the fountain. Feel free to find a bed in any of the vacant dwelling places. If you need anything, we flame speakers are at your service. Thank you. Sorry again about the fountain. <laughs> <laughs> I like you. You're the one I like. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I give a, a nod of deference, and I head off to probably wherever there's like a steam room that I can take a bath in, since it's been two days. 
You would definitely know that there would be one of those here. Um, one of the few comforts of the mountaintop monastery is they indeed have a small but very functional, uh, something of a natural hot spring. You find that and, and settle in. Clicks, after leaving this scene, what do you do? I mean, Clicks is going to find a spot to go and be alone, of course. Okay. As Clicks does, and go to bed. Is there anything box like in nature that Clicks could kind of hunker down in and sleep for the night? Because Clicks does love a good box to sleep really in. Really leaning into this, aren't you? <laughs> if it fits, Clicks sits. If it fits, oh I sit. Oh my god. Go ahead and give me an investigation check. 19. You actually see in a one stack of. Stack of boxes. On a 19, everything's a box. <laughs> I mean, basically, the whole world's your box, really. <laughs> there's, there's one of these small little private dwelling places, and inside of it, there's kind of a makeshift bed frame with no bed or anything in it. Ooh, perfect. And you think, hey, as good as anything else. Yeah, that is ideal. All right. Andromedy, after your late night relaxation, do you retire or do you do anything else? No, I think I I find like my old bunk, I suppose. Yeah, and I vacant. I go rest there. The three of you retire after this somewhat dramatic evening, <laughs> and this is a great place to have all three of you level up. So reaching level four, as you sleep, I would like all three of you to make one more wisdom saving throw for me. Twenty-four. Four. Sixteen. Andromedy, despite the somewhat traumatic events of the last couple of hours, you find very restful sleep and do not stir whatsoever. Clicks, you toss and turn a bit, but in the clicks sized box in which you have found, you are able to find well rest. Making a couple biscuits and then calling it a night. Gron, however, in whatever corner space you tried to find sleep this evening. You just can't. You toss and turn, stir suddenly at nothing, and then try and go back to sleep. It's like one of those nights where you know you have to wake up and be productive the next day, and so that just keeps you awake. Grunt grunts unreasonably. Ugh. Ooh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> he uh -oh. usually grunts so reasonably. That's true. With a reasonable grunt. Uh-oh. This one is not so. Often enough, as you toss and turn, you can't help but return to the same feeling that you had at the end of your vision. This sensation of being able to smell Hargot and feeling like Califex was out there in the world somewhere and this trembling of Mogus. You awake the next day but you are extremely tired. Gron, I'm going to say for only mental-based ability checks, so wisdom, intelligence, charisma, you're going to have disadvantage. So kind of a half exhaustion, if you will. As the three of you awake and look out into the central scene the next morning, you can see Volkos is still there, seemingly unmoved from the position you last saw him, standing in front of the fountain. The lava, however, now completely reformed into its original state, and the fountain itself completely repaired. Without turning back to greet the three of you, he says, Why? Why would the God of Destiny bring you to me, to this place, bound to the ancient practices of our divination? A moderate control of elements, perhaps. But she did not deliver you to a grand weapon to tip the scales of balance. Not yet. A guide, perhaps. In an effort to continue to seek the gods' wisdom and willing. A way, perhaps, to be found to restore that balance between the war gods. I... He turns to look at the three of you. Do you have something in mind, Sophistes? <laughs> you know me too well. After all, the machinations of the God of the Forge have from time to time again been sought by other gods to help win their fights. I believe I should guide you to the Forge God's domain. Prepare yourselves this morning, for we head for Mount Velas. How do you all react? It clicks, uh, instead of, you know, moodily 
shrugging, scoffing, or rolling his eyes, just kind of quietly gives a curt nod and uh, is ready to go. Okay. As it is meant to be. One can only hope so much. Matitis. Gonna be an average day today. <laughs> Those port port and dice. Yep. He goes on to say, The journey will not be easy, my friends. It will be about two days, if we are lucky, of very difficult terrain. That is why, thoroughly, I believe, I am meant to guide you, but one can only say, the conditions may go from frigid mountaintop air to incredibly, extremely hot, passing by various volcanic terrain. But to meet with the god of the forge himself in an effort to repel this monstrous siege, well, as you said in drama, as it is meant to be. So, you can see that a number of the flame speakers, including Marcos and Yanis, bid your party farewell as Volkos announces to them that he will be leaving them for a time. They give you various rations and other traveling supplies and bid you a safe journey. Hey, uh, before we go, do you guys have any, like, weapons i can borrow i just have this like huge mall and i was kind of hoping for something i could throw <laughs> oh that's great um yanis the, the kind of older flame speaker among the group steps forward a bit and looks up at you gran and says well that won't do will it go ahead and make a persuasion check <laughs> 24 holy shit <laughs> He holds out both of his hands with his palms facing down and speaks some words in a language you don't know at all. And piles of axes of various size materialize and clatter on the rock below his hands. Take your pick, boy. Aw, oh, sick. <laughs> yeah, you can see hand axes. Uh, and battle axes, and some large pole arms with axe heads, and just all kinds of stuff that he just appeared to make out of thin air. I could just take any of this? Wow. Uh, alright. I take two hand axes, and, uh, and I'm gonna take four javelins. Thank you. You're welcome. So as you leave and head towards Mount Velas, Instead of doing a series of skill challenges, this section of travel will play out a little bit differently. Volkos will be guiding you, and so we are going to do a series of group survival checks each day to kind of just determine the pace and any things that may impede you along the way. But basically, he is giving aid and guidance to everyone as this is happening. So to start off on this first day back out into the mountain wilderness, I'd like all three of you to make a survival check, and all three of you get an additional d4 added to this roll. 19. It's going to be a 17 over here. 11. Okay. How dumb is this? I'm literally going to average these rolls together. I don't think that's dumb at all. That's... Totally reasonable. For this first leg of travel, your pace is very steady. Uh, you don't encounter anything particularly hostile, though you are, of course, very high up already, the monastery being itself on top of one mountain, as you spend the first part of this day hiking down a bit and then up a series of ridges and trails onto the next nearest mountain and slowly working your way across these mountaintops towards Mount Velas to the north. As you're traveling, Volkos, just kind of making conversation to you, Andromedy says, So, is the year in Akros worth all of the reading that I'm sure they made you do? I like reading, Volkos. I do. <laughs> I'm sorry. That I did not forget. <laughs> uh, again, I still think it's sort of difficult to see the bigger picture. You and Polamid are both, you're both very insightful, but I always feel like there's some grander scheme or underlying 
plan at work and I, I feel like as a, as a devotee of Clothis, someone who's supposed to guide people along their paths, I need to be able to see the whole picture and I still feel like that's out of my reach. For all our years together, I never thought that feeling unwise in you, Andromni, you know that. It is difficult, you see. Clothis has only returned to this world so recently, and as such, she is only just beginning to pull at the threads of fate and beckon oracles into her service. You're but one of the first, but as her numbers grow, I'm sure you will find others who share this feeling. And then you can commiserate with them. <laughs> <laughs> Andromeda smiles. They sort of pet Scully gently between her antennae and throws a grin back to Volkos. Let's have the three of you go ahead and make another group survival check. 21. 9. 7. What's the roll on the die for the 7? 3. Would you like it to be a 10 instead? It would bring it up to 14. The second part of the day here is also steady. It appears Volkos is doing exactly what he believed was fated for him to do, and that's guide you safely towards Mount Velas. So your pace is, once again, steady. Along this leg of the journey, as the elevation continues to rise, Volkos looks to you, Gron, and says, So then, how does one such as yourself, you know, like you said, with the horns and all, wind up in Akros, of all places? Gron, before you answer his question, Andromedy, you're looking at the two of them ahead of you, and suddenly you see a glimpse of the future. Gron slips on a ledge and begins falling down the side of the mountain. I say to Gron, um, you might want to walk on the inside of the path for a while. Why? Just a feeling I've got. Volkos looks at the two of you and looks down at the mountain path and says, Ah, oh, you know what, Andromedy, that is not a bad idea. Let me take the outside for a little while. Forgive us, uh, uh, Gran, please. Go on. The Akroans brought me there, locked me up. They thought I was one of the dangerous minotaurs. Do you still have the manacles sort of on your wrists? He does. I would not have taken them off, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said before, uh, Akros likes to consider itself uh, sort of a beacon of civilization, defending Theros from the wilds beyond its walls. But I have found, in the short time that I have walked this world, that there are monsters everywhere. <clears throat> I would not pay their fear of you as much of any mind as your fear of them. Fear of them? I don't fear them. Ah? Huh? This is good. They're all talk anyways. And so, if you continue on your way, let's have one more check before the end of this traveling day. Don't forget your D4s. 3 plus 3 plus 3, so 9. Oh wow, a nat 20 plus 3 plus 2 is 25. 12. Okay. So you are all traveling along the afternoon sky, beginning to set in the mountains beyond. You are so high up that you're beginning to be at cloud level, the wind swirling around you. It's becoming quite cold, and in the distance, you can see snow on the mountainsides around you. Maybe this is the first time Clix or Gron has seen snow, up close at least. <coughs> Within the howling winds, Gron and Andromedy faintly hear a howl of a different kind. Volko stops your party with a hand. On guard, friends. I fear we are not alone. The two of you go ahead and give me perception checks. I hope you roll well, because I'm I'm at a nat one. Ten. Gron, you can you can faintly pick up this this howling in the distance. It vaguely sounds Minotaur, Minotaur adjacent, but not in a way that you're particularly familiar. It is getting louder. <coughs> Volkos has you stopped on the side of a mountain. What do the three of you do? Is it single file marching order, or are we two by two? At this point, it would pretty much be single file. You are on a very narrow path, 
very high up on on these mountain top ridges. So I'd probably be in the very back. It's probably Volkos, Gron, Clix, Andromedy. Clix, you can go ahead and roll perception as well. Now that they've pointed it out. Mm-hmm. It's a nat twenty. No Ooh. shit. Clix, you you had a hard time hearing it with the the billowing winds, but after Gron kind of takes a moment and Volkos and Andromedy. You hone in your feline ears. It's coming from above you. I think we need to pick up the pace. Clicks, you can tell not only is it coming from above you, but as you hone in on this howling, it's not particularly far away. On a nat 20, you think that if you were to try and run, you might get caught off guard. All right, I will ready an action to cast a spell in case something comes within close range of us. Okay. Andromedy is readying a spell. What are the other two of you doing? I think I'm just going to draw my weapons. I can't think of anything that Clix would disguise himself into for safety. Okay. If you want to look around and try and find some place to take cover in the immediate vicinity, I will give you a, another either survival or investigation check for that. Absolutely taking it. Yeah, it's a seven. Yeah, you don't see too much cover at all. It's this narrow pass, rock cliffside on one side and a, and a ledge on the other. I need all three of you to give me dexterity saving throws. 22. 18. I certainly fail that. 10. And then let's roll for initiative. 15. Four. I'm very caught off guard. Also four. What's your modifier? Plus two. Roll off. I got a ten. I got a six. Okay, so I go before you on initiative four. If allies roll the same initiative, you can just coordinate who does it. Yeah, that's true. So the deck save was for the following. Out of the swirling mist and snow above you, a giant boulder comes hurling down the side of the mountain. Gron and Clix and Volkos are able to narrowly duck out of the way. Andromedy is hit by said boulder. I need you to make a strength saving throw as you take six points of bludgeoning damage. Okay, I got a 19 on the strength save. And are now prone, hanging on to the ledge, but were not knocked completely off the side of the mountain. Gee, thanks. From out of the swirling tundra above you, you see a vaguely minotaur-shaped figure covered from head to toe in white fur with a blue face and very sharply curled horns. It howls out, and Volkos shouts, We've got yetis! Up first is Clix. Shit, I didn't hide. (laughs) Well, that's cool. I am not hidden. Uh, I'm a tiny cat with a couple little daggers, and I'm just going to go after a fucking Yeti and see what we do. So it is about 20 feet up the rock face from where you are right now. We're going to do a we're gonna do a, a bow attack. I'm going to fire at this fucker. Okay. Is uh, 16 to hit? Uh, 16 hits. Eight damage. Cool. You ready your bow and fire, striking this large, monstrous creature, some sort of cursed minotaur turned yeti, and strike it in its shoulder. It howls out louder. Volkos is up next. You see Volkos bring his hands together and swirl around a ball of flaming energy, shooting it up at this yeti with a guiding bolt. This flare rockets towards the Yeti, strikes it, and now the one side where Clix had previously shot his arrow is now glowing faintly with red light. The next attack against the Yeti getting advantage from this guiding bolt. Just in time for Gron or Andromedy. I'm going to cast Heroism on Clix. I'm going to also use my voice of authority which allows Clix to use his reaction to make another attack. Oh, very cool. What authoritarian voice? 
What do you? What does it sound like? What do you do? Okay, yeah. So, sort of the the effect of this spell when Andromeda casts heroism out from the book springs this sort of actual tapestry, sort of depicting some heroic deed from the past, and that tapestry then sort of wraps around the target like a shawl, and Andromeda will say, sort of with their voice of authority, now is your moment for greatness, seize it, and you are spurred to get this additional action. As that happens, Clix starts to turn back at the sound of Andromeda's voice, and though planning to initially roll his eyes at them, before even finishing the turn of his head, feels a very strange feeling of what Clix can only think of as not being afraid. I don't think Clix even understands what <laughs> courage is. He just nice. knows what fear is, so he just thinks of this as not fear. It's magically welded um, into him. And it, it's magic, weird feeling. He doesn't know what to make of it, but he readies his bow, and let's see what fruits your uh, your authority hath yielded, Scala. A nat fucking 20. <laughs> Ooh. It was meant to be. <laughs> wow. That is awesome. Oh, that is cool. Beautiful. 14 damage. Hell yeah. Good shit. And can I use my movement to get back onto the ledge? Yes. Okay, cool. I will do that and find sure footing. Great. That's Gron. I'm just going to throw my two hand axes at him. Okay. So I draw these hand axes from my belt, and I throw one and then the other immediately after. Like, first one is going to be uh, 19 to hit. Definitely hits. Ooh, and that's 11 slashing damage. Second one is only going to be a 13 to hit. That will just miss. Okay. You strike at it, but it seems to brush off the second attack, having been made fully aware of your incoming axe throws. Can anyone do a really good Wookiee voice? <laughs> no. The answer is no. No, guess not. Anyways, that's what it would sound like. So this Yeti, now seemingly injured, howling in pain, narrows its gaze towards its most recent attacker, Gron. I need you to make a constitution saving throw. It's a 22. Well, fuck. Okay. Uh, that'll pass. So you take half of the following. Get some more dice. 14 halved to 7 cold damage. As its chilling gaze pierces into you, you can feel your body begin to seize up, almost become paralyzed at this chilling gaze, but you break free and are not paralyzed. After gazing at Gron and the paralysis failing to take hold, it screams out once more before leaping off the side of this mountain towards you. It's going to make an attack on Clix, an attack on Gron, because the two of you are next to each other. So the attack on Clix, I believe, will hit with a 16 plus 6. Yeah, that'll, that'll hit. And the 10 plus 6 does a 16 hit Gron. Yes. Okay. So on clicks, uh, on clicks we have nine slashing damage plus two cold damage, and then on Gron, eight slashing damage and five cold damage. It's massive claws cutting into the two of you. That's its turn. Now it's clicks. You gain four temp HP at the start of your turn. Good to know. Got it. It's at the start of each of your turns while heroism is going. This very large, much larger than Gron, maybe even larger than Hargot, monstrous figure is now standing directly between you and Gron. We're doing it. We're doing it. Nope, we are not doing it. <laughs> Both were a three. Oh uh -oh. my gods. So seven, which I don't think hits. That misses, yeah. Okay. I think you can do an offhand too, right? Yeah, I can. An 18. That'll hit. That's okay, thank God. I'm gonna add my sneak attack. That's a nine total. You slash into this thing. It is looking quite injured now that you see it up close. The blood kind of pooling down from its matted white fur as it continues to scream out. Uh, we go to Volkos. Careful now, don't let it pull you over the edge. He's going to back up slightly away from the party and he's just gonna cast another guiding bolt. 
hits. Another bit of damage there. You see the familiar guiding bolt from Volkos. Um, and now the Yeti is once more lit up, just in time for Andromedy or Gron to get advantage on the next attack. You want to go ahead and take this one, Gron? You can probably hit harder than I can. Be my pleasure. Let's give it the business. Yeah, I'm going to draw my maul and smash it. Go for it. It's an 18 to hit. That'll hit. Double sixes. Oh, fuck. Nice. Plus five. 17 bludgeoning damage. Smash it. You do it that. Okay. On Death's Door, you can see this Yeti kind of begin to fall and stumble about as you smash into it. It staggers towards you, taking one of its large hands and putting it on the mountainside next to it to steady itself as it coughs up some of this blood. What do you do? How far is it from the ledge? Like feet away. It's very narrow. So if I could push it 10 feet, I could conceivably. Yeah, conceivably. conceivably. All right. Yeah, then as it reels for my attack, I'm going to shove it with my horns. Okay. <laughs> and it has to succeed on a strength saving throw against 15. Okay. It adds five to this. It is quite strong. Four on the dice. That's not going to do it, folks. It staggers back, and you can see it try to hold on to the mountainside as you push into it with your horns, and it... <sighs> falls off the side of the mountain, clicks, I'm gonna need you to go ahead and make a dexterity saving throw. I fucking knew it. I knew it. Uh, 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 16. Yeah. It tries to grab out to make basically an opportunity attack as it's being forced out of somebody else's area. It reaches out to grab it, clicks. You dodge out of the way as this thing falls through the air down the mountainside into the clouds below. And what sound does it make as that happens? All right. We exit initiative. Oh, that was fun. That's... That is the word for it, Gron. Is everyone all right? Ah, you know, I've got a bruise from that rock, but all in all, I feel like I can keep going. Okay. We should... We should find a place to rest. I think we are going to lose the light regardless. As you all take a minute to collect yourselves on this mountainside, eager to find a little more safety after this encounter, I think that's where we'll end our session. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me, with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake and May. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening. Do a couple alternate laughs so we can layer them. Okay. <laughs> Dumbest shit ever. That is great. I almost don't. I don't want you to layer them. I want you to keep that for final cut. Yeah, that's so, so bad. So stupid. <laughs> <laughs>